Hello. Isn't this neat? So I'm staring at a BGH-1 recording raw, and it is following me around. Got a terabyte of storage, which should last, what, close to three hours? Maybe more, and more than enough battery to support that. Yet there's something very wrong about this. Something which I can only describe as a boondongle. Right, so I've got a couple of new toys, and the first one of those that I want to talk about, not too thrilled about, is the DJI RS2. I mean, look at it. It's, it's, it's a mess. In order to get this recording ProRes RAW, I've had to connect the Atomos 5, which gets HDMI in, because it only sports HDMI, HDMI RAW, and in order to get the face tracking, that connects back out to the Falcon Eye on the DJI Ronin. And in order for me to actually control any menu, menu settings, understand if I'm setting aperture or whatnot, I actually have an SDI connection to the Blackmagic VideoSys 12G 7-inch. And I'll talk about the Atomos and Blackmagic in a little bit. Uh, but first, I want to talk about the DJI Ronin RS2, or DJI RS2, because they've removed Ronin from the name, even though the bag still has Ronin on it. And the reason I got the RS2 instead of the, well, instead of the RSC2 is the price difference wasn't that much. And the RS2 is only slightly heavier because the, the lighter material, the composite, as opposed to metal. And it supports a heavier weight. I actually got about eight pounds on here before it freaked out because I had the monitors on this. It's supposed to take up to 10 pounds, but probably just the way the weight distribution made it a little bit harder. But now we're back down to about four pounds, which is about the limit on the original RSC for that matter. The reason I didn't get the RSC wasn't actually the weight, uh, even though right now it's at about $280 as opposed to $1,000 for the pro version with the Raven Eye here. But because the DJI RS2 advertised being able to do face tracking without an app, you do face tracking without, without needing the DJI app, it turns out that's wrong. And that's because the DJI RS2 won't even turn on unless you've connected it, activated it with the app. So it will just sit there asking you to activate it with the app until you do so. And it needs internet, it needs to create an account with DJI, and it's just a complete mess. You know, I just want something to work. When I first started doing these videos, admittedly I took a lot of uh, strongly held beliefs and lessened them a little. The first thing of all is creating, obviously, a Google account to get onto, to post to YouTube. There weren't really many options. Same thing with getting Final Cut Pro and DaVinci Resolve. I actually ended up getting Final Cut Pro because DaVinci Resolve was took me three months on B&H's waitlist to get shipped the serial key because you can just download that unless you were doing it through the App Store, which defeated part of the purpose of not getting tied to the Mac platform. There's a trend for equipment makers to espouse their companion apps, Canon, Leica, Panasonic, pretty much everyone, while equipment from the likes of Edelkron and DJI use iOS or Android applications as their primary controllers. This makes sense in some cases where you can leverage mass market portable computers with a bevy of integrated sensors and excellent bright screens. It makes a lot of sense to utilize a portable phone or tablet to control the low-cost consumer DJI drones compared to what it would add to the cost of the controller to build in a bright, responsive, and durable screen with network connectivity to check for up-to-date restrictions. I don't see any benefit in this gimbal to what it's done by requiring the app to register it. Now, the Raven Eye, admittedly, does have some benefits where you can uh, transmit HDMI wirelessly to the app, and that makes perfect sense. I understand wanting to use the app for that. But... Except for that use case, there's absolutely no benefit to the app that I can tell. Uh, it's just a way for DJI to track sales, I suppose, and then push notifications to you if it has a new sale and wants you to buy something, which is just complete. It makes it longer to get everything up and running. It, it's completely irritating. And we'll come back to that when we talk about the, the Atomos Ninja 5 as well, how frustrating it is to just want to get something done, to get work done, and have irritation after irritation to basically get this setup going. And admittedly, they're one-off annoyances, but they're unnecessary. And what I've decided in my small channel is effectively my small protest is if there's absolutely no purpose to an app, but it's required to do something, to use something, I'm just not going to talk about it. In fact, I'm going to stop talking about the DJI Ronin uh, there's plenty of other videos to talk about that. And I'm going to move on to the Atomos and the Blackmagic design. So BMD versus Atomos. There's a lot of similarity here if you're looking for just 
an off-camera recorder. Maybe your camera only outputs 10-bit externally or it only outputs 422 or 444 externally and you want that extra chroma, but you don't need the raw conversion. Let's begin with the Blackmagic Design Video Assist. And here we're looking at the second generation, which supports DCI 4K recording at 2398, 24, or 25 frames per second, or ultra high def 4K at 30, 50, and 60 frames per second, and their NTSC variants over either HDMI or SDI 12G connections, full size on the 7 inch or micro BNC on the 5 inch. The earlier first generation was limited to 1080p at the same frame rates, although both could capture 10-bit 422. Both generations when off look quite similar with either a 5-inch or 7-inch screen, as the name suggests, almost 13 or 18 centimeters. They're both roughly 1.45 inches thick, while the 7-inch model is twice as massive at 825 grams, that's 29 ounces. And with the BMD, you've got a whole bunch of ports you can connect to SDI 12G out, 12G in, you can cross convert HDMI, uh, choose between HDMI in or SDI. It also has analog audio in, it's got SD card recording, it's got headphone monitoring they both do, and unlike the Atomos, it's got dual batteries. Actually just pop out a battery and it will keep working. Very convenient. And I'm actually running that off of lower capacity batteries that I had kicking around for my Hasselblad, so all the better there. I found navigating and toggling options on the BMD to be much simpler with intuitive controls on the main screen, which led into a clear tabbed menu system that was easy to manipulate. There's a single page where you can enable or disable each of the overlays and tools for the main view, all represented by label toggles. Atomos, on the other hand, has a number of icons which often leave me trying to recall which does what exactly. It's not that the icons don't provide a clue, but they're small and in order to not obscure the image below them, not easy to see quickly. Atomos also likes to use horizontal scrolling, which means that icons won't always be in the same place, depending on where you stop scrolling, and generally makes poor use of space, trying too hard to achieve an aesthetic objective at the expense of usability on such a small screen. But the Blackmagic design is really designed for touch. It's the same interface they've got on their cameras, uh, nice big touch targets, especially on the 7-inch. Perhaps I'm just the mayor of Simpleton, but I just want something to work. I don't need to think about it. With the Blackmagic design, everything's enabled by default. If you want to change... Uh, the version of ProRes, you want to change to DNX, you want to change to Blackmagic RAW, assuming your camera supports it, click on their coding, and it goes straight to that encoding, and you don't have to worry about anything else. So I've actually got two Ninjas here. I've got the Ninja 5 Plus on the BGH1, and I've got the original Ninja 5 up on the Olympus OMD M1X, and they're both shooting ProRes, and they both have their own little annoyance. Things aren't as easy with the Atomos Ninja 5, but before we get to that, let's talk about the Ninja itself. Unlike the Video Assist, the Ninja is only available in a nominally 5-inch model, although Atomos sells other, larger monitors. Comparatively, the BMD 5-inch model is thicker and about 10% heavier than the Ninja 5, which is only 12.7 ounces, 360 grams versus 410 grams of the Video Assist 5-inch, and 1.2 versus 1.44-inch thick. The frame of the Ninja 5 is actually listed as 2 millimeters bigger in both width and height. Recently, Atomos has released the Ninja 5 Plus, which looks very similar to the first generation with some improved internals allowing for 8K processing. The 5 Plus screen is also supposedly slightly larger at 5.2 inches compared to 5 inches, but you're not likely to notice. It's also a whopping $14.99 US compared to $5.99 for the first generation Ninja 5 or $7.95 for the BMD 5 inch 12G. If you want to add the Ninja 5 Plus with SDI module, you're looking at a 1699 package. If you're on scene and all you want to do is hit record and start recording. If you decide you've, if you've been shooting ProRes and you're like, oh, I really know I get ProRes raw because the lighting is getting chaotic and I want to record something. You can't just go and hit ProRes, change the recording format and go to ProRes raw and then start recording. If you've never done that before, you'll get hit with an activation warning, which probably in the manual, it's on the website, but if you're just checking out and running with it, you wouldn't expect it because you actually have to select it and then hit confirm. And if you've never played with that, it looks like it would just work. When you first try to confirm switching into either ProRes RAW or Avidin X, the Ninja 5 will ask you to enter a four digit code. If you have internet access at the time, it's a fairly quick, if not unexpected, process to open up the activation page, type in the identifier displayed on the Ninja 5 and get your code, which is tied to that internal hardware identifier. Now, I thought with the Ninja 5 Plus, this would be a little bit different because the advertising goes that it comes with uh, H.265 pre-installed high efficiency video codec, as well as ProRes RAW, and of course you can record to Avid. But that turns out that it's not exactly the case. 
just like with the original Ninja, none of those things are actually enabled out of the box. You can't just plug it in and start shooting. You have to enable all of them. And irritatingly, the process is, in my opinion, even worse. So the new Ninja 5 Plus comes with H.265, uh, pre-authorized. You can get it for free, um, but it's not enabled by default. The same thing with ProRes RAW and ProRes RAW 8K, which is a separate activation, and Avid DNX. Once on the Atomos site, you'll be asked for additional information, including a serial number, which, for the life of me, I couldn't find anywhere on the device, and its menus, or even the manual. It is attached to the box it came in, so if you toss that out, you're out of luck. Or you can put some random 13 character alphanumeric string in and see if it passes, because it doesn't seem like it affects successful activation. And once you've done that, you find your device, you click on uh, download tokens, you actually have to activate everything and then just download one token at the end because that'll activate everything that you've activated so far. Otherwise, you'll just start downloading a whole bunch of tokens. I have to figure out which was the latest one. There's a timestamp in the file, but just download once after you've clicked activate for everything. Uh, the only thing that's not included is if you didn't buy the pro kit, uh, you don't get SDI activated or raw over SDI. There's interesting history between Blackmagic Design and Atomos, both of which are not coincidentally Australia-based companies. Blackmagic was founded in 2001, but the interesting bit comes from 2009 and 2010, when they began spreading their cash around acquiring the companies and intellectual property for which they're most well-known today. When they came to town for the National Association of Broadcasters trade show in 2010, they announced the new release of the recently acquired DaVinci Resolve software for macOS and supporting Apple ProRes file formats. When Blackmagic returned to the 2012 in AB, they announced their first cinema camera. From capture to editing, Blackmagic effectively had an end-to-end -end pipeline for production, and they developed their own RAW format to get the most out of each piece along the way. They've released a no-cost SDK for macOS, Microsoft Windows, and GNU Linux for reading the RAW files, but you shouldn't confuse that with an open specification or open source. The SDK is still encumbered with licensing restrictions, as far as I can tell, and there's no freely available specification for the underlying format. ProRes, of course, is no better. Although the original versions have been reverse engineered, Apple is quick to discourage their use as leading to decoding errors, performance degradation, incompatibility, and stability, imploring that if you see someone violating their IP to please narc on them at once. After all, they only want what's best for you. ProRes was quickly adopted as an acquisition codec, as well as the intermediate format used internally by Final Cut since 2007, offering a post-production optimized workflow with its all intraframe compression and high-quality lossy compression options in either 422 or, less often used for acquisition, 444 chroma sampling. As the story goes, while BMD was announcing their new, significantly cheaper, macOS version of DaVinci Resolve in 2010, a recently departed employee founded a competitor and was chatting up Steve Jobs about the idea that would eventually become the Ninja Line and lead to a close collaboration in what, in 2018, would be the announcement of ProRes RAW. There are currently exactly two companies that create products that write ProRes RAW, Atomos and DGI, although the latter part is just an interesting bit of trivia for this video. It has led to some speculation that spite towards Atomos founder Jeremy Young might be one of the reasons that Blackmagic has not yet added support for ProRes RAW and DaVinci Resolve. Fortunately, Jeremy Young left Atomos in February 2021, and Atomos was quick to distance themselves from him after he decided to break Australian COVID quarantine and face the hefty fine of, well, um, about the equivalent of two Ninja 5 Pluses. So... Maybe we'll see ProRes RAW support in DaVinci Resolve 18. Or Until then, one route is using Final Cut Pro to read and convert the file into ProRes 444 if you want to do color grading in DaVinci, or 422 if you're less picky or want to do grading in Final Cut Pro. The nice thing about ProRes RAW is that you're essentially getting a ProRes 444 quality from a Bayer sensor, but at a reduced file size since it only needs to store a single 12-bit number at any one pixel rather than one per color channel. There are a couple of gotchas with ProRes RAW and Final Cut, rough edges that may trip you up, which I didn't realize until after I'd exported ProRes 422 and cleaned up some of the original files to free up disk space. The first is that you need to make sure that the top-level project is set to wide color gamut. If you're like me and you basically create a bunch of events inside the same project, you might have forgotten what you set that as. Also, in order to tweak the effective ISO speed or to set a baseline temperature, you want to open the Settings tab on the inspector. Obviously, do this before mucking with any color adjustments. 
Another neat opportunity, which may make life a little easier if you're working with multiple different cameras, is that you can change the options for how Final Cut interprets the 12-bit linear data in the ProRes RAW file. By default, it'll try to interpret it as the camera's native log profile, Canon C-Log2, Panasonic V-Log, etc. You can change that so that you're working in a single gamma curve. Annoyingly, not all this flexibility is supported by all cameras that output to ProRes RAW through the Atomos, things like changing the ISO or changing the white balance. Apple has a support document listing what's supported by which cameras, but it's unfortunately out of date. Because most of the supported cameras support a 10-bit log color profile, RAW provides much less of a benefit than it does for stills photography, where the other alternative is usually an 8-bit JPEG, a file format that was formalized nearly three decades ago, back in the time of Mac OS 7, Windows 3.1, and the Linux kernel was on a steady march towards version 0.99. It also goes without saying that just because you're writing a ProRes RAW, you're not magically going to get extra dynamic range that your sensor wasn't capable of before. If what you want is RAW recording, your decision may come down to which cameras are supported for the RAW recording for each device. Very few are supported by both, like the S1H, and there's a lot more supported by the Atomos. Now, if all you want is a monitor, uh, it's probably cheaper options, but you know these are both within the ballpark of some of the cheaper options that offer HDR display, LUTs, uh, thousand nit plus displays. I much prefer the way that BMD has gone, pay a little bit extra to cover any licensing cost and be generous. I just want it to work tonight. I don't want to sing for my supper and jump for a click to get something to work and jump through all the hoops that Atomos has, just register, download a file, copy it to a drive, then reload it on the device and keep it all straight for if you've got multiple devices. This is the thing, like I know Pro has been devalued and all these devices, but I just can't see, you know, I think some, something pro and obviously not a pro. If you think pro, I, it, I think of something that is reliable, will work, and you know exactly what to expect. I wanna be able to go into a store, grab a new one off the shelf if something dies, and be able to plug that in and start working. That is not something you can do with either the DJI devices or the Atomos devices. It is something you do with the Blackmagic devices. And to that extent, the only one of the things well, and the Panasonic BGH1, that I would consider suitable to be pro-ish is the BMD. Now, there's an argument there that a real pro is not gonna be shooting ProRes RAW anyway. Uh, you're gonna be using these as external monitors, maybe copying them as proxies, in which case, let's take a look at BMD versus Atomos. And there's a lot less separating them at that point, as long as you don't need the SDI connections. Obviously the Atmos is half the price. It only has the one battery. It's decided to go for a much slimmer form factor. Uh, again, functionality versus form. It has the uh, SATA card caddy on the back. So if you know you're gonna be right into the SATA cards, which is a big benefit of this, it is more convenient once you get the caddies and just keep writing to that. Uh, whereas you could use an external drive with the BMD, but that's one more thing you've got to connect to the USB-C port and hang it on. and less convenient there, but it does take SD cards. Uh, it's got the two SD cards, so you can again hot swap them. The new version of it, the Video Assist, the 12G, also addresses one of the shortcomings of its predecessor. The Atomos has a thousand nits, and the Ninja Plus 5, the Ninja 5 Plus still has a thousand nits. The biggest problem that people saw with the BMD, the original BMD, was that it was pretty dark. It was only about 300 nits, if I recall, whereas the new versions, the 12Gs, are a whopping 2,500 nits. Uh, they both support HDR displays. They both support loading LUTs and showing LUTs. Uh, so otherwise, a lot of the functionality is the same. If you want the brighter display and a seven inch option, you go with the Shinobi. Uh, but between the Video Assist and the Ninja 5 Plus, uh, Blackmagic Display has the brighter display. It is much easier to use in my opinion. You don't have to worry about jumping through hoops, going through registration processes, downloading files and transferring them. Uh, the only drawback if you're going to write to larger cheaper sata drives the atomos is going to be more convenient the atomos is also lighter although if you add the sdi module it's four ounce or 120 grams swings the size advantage back to the bmd by 10 percent the bmd is rated at a higher power draw depending on how you weigh that with the dual battery slots and your specific use cases personally i don't see it as a decision defining factor the 7 inch provides 48 volt phantom power over mini XLR compared to 3.5 millimeter, 1 8 inch input on the Atomos, while the 5 inch BMD lacks mic input. Again, I don't think this is particularly interesting. I expect most people already have a more capable or convenient means of capturing audio input, but for a few, it could be useful. The 
Panasonic DMW XLR1 XLR adapter is nearly $400 after all, and BMD claims a lower noise floor than most cameras' internal recording circuitry. The 7-inch Atomos Shinobi is not too dissimilar from the slightly smaller but heavier BMD 7-inch 12G with 2200 nits and 10-bit and a focus on pure monitoring, obviously lacking the recording functionality of the Ninjas or the Video Assists. The Atomos Shogun 7 is even closer. It's a little bit bigger than the 7-inch Video Assist, but lighter, 738 grams versus 825 grams, with a similar power draw, dual battery support, SDI, HDMI, cross-convert, and up to 60 frames per second at DCI 4K, but also 25% price premium, $1299 US. It also sports a slightly larger 7.2-inch, brighter 3000 nits screen and a caveated ISO recording feature for that extra $300. The older Video Assist 3G models are quite similar to the 12G models, although with a less bright, less capable screen and only supporting 1080p, but with a significant price savings of $300 US in both 5-inch and 7-inch models. The Video Assist 12Gs make for better monitors, which is what I'm using it for today. The Atomos not only sounds like a jet engine, but notoriously it doesn't show the full image on their monitors when recording in DCI 4K. And while early adopters complained of a magenta cast on the Video Assist 12Gs, this seems to have been mostly addressed. I haven't noticed it when using the monitor in situ, even comparing with the Ninja 5 Plus right next to it. However, I did notice a slight pink issue to the pure whites when looking at the white balance recording and looking specifically for in a dark room a slight pink issue in whites was indeed visible with potentially a little warmth in the grays but i didn't really see it a problem in actual use and just to be clear when i say i saw a pink issue in the whites that was of the black magic not on a video taken by the black magic any video taken by the black magic is not going to be affected by display issues but if the reason you're buying it is for externally recording RAW, there are very few cameras that have chosen to go with BMD so far. Uh, obviously, aside from Blackmagic cameras, which will shoot it in internally, uh, there's the S1H. The BGH won't actually output uh, RAW to the BMD device. Uh, a handful of others, whereas Atomos has been really adding lots of camera support. The OMD EM1X, the BGH1, uh, Canon R5, uh, but not the R6. If your concern is shooting a raw recording, it really is going to come down to support. And there was a video that if your camera does support both, like the S1H, uh, the ProRes RAW seemed to have more control left, whereas the BMD B RAW coming out of the Blackmagic video, video Assist uh, had more of the image already baked in, it sounded like, more noise applied, uh, more denoising, et cetera, compared to the ProRes on the same camera. Assuming it's not a question to which your camera can output RAW, there's really no clear winner here. It's a question of functionality of ports versus the design, the sleekness of the Atomos. Yeah. Even the reviewer from DPR couldn't make up his mind. And I'm going to leave it at that. Thanks for watching. Now I'm going to go steal that camera to take a few extra shots for not the next video, but two videos from actually three videos from when I'm making this, but two videos after I've published this got three videos waiting right now. It's all a little bit timey-wimey, but I don't know. you'll see which one it is. Uh, hopefully you stick around for that one as well. And until then, thanks for watching. Cheers.